Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. And I know it's lunch time, so feel free to grab some food because this session is, um, is more of an interactive session. I like to run this in a different way. Uh, they call this bird sofa feather, so it means that uh, people who have this uh, similar mindset of, uh, or similar interest of certain topics, they will come here to have a discussion. Um, so in this session, we're going to talk about user experience. I see some people go grab food, so feel free to do so. And feel free to eat, by the way. Um, and uh, so, uh, yeah, so like I said, I want to run this session more interactive, and uh, it's 15 minutes of a session, and I hope that we can use the first half of the session for me to talk about uh, the customer data we have collected and how we are using those data to drive user experience. And uh, for the second half, I'm being passed out the, 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 the post-it note and some pen. So while you are doing this, uh, listening to me for having the conversation and share, for me to share those data, if you are also using O3D before, and if you have such certain expectation on O3DE, feel free to write them down because I want to have the second half of the session, I want to hear from you. Like, what do you like this O3D should be for, to make your life easier? And uh, how can we improve that for future um, customers? So that's for today's session. So before I start, I want to introduce myself. My name is Yui Su, and uh, I'm currently a UX manager for AWS Game Tech team. And I also help co-founded uh, the UI UX special interest group in O3DE community. And um, so the, the current uh, the UI UX SIG has been running successfully. We, we are meeting every Thursday uh, to talk about user experience. So feel free to join us on Discord if you wanted to continue on with this conversation. Um, so I, I have been working with, with the UX industry over 15 years so far and solving different type of UX problems. And um, I, so most recently I've been kind of developed a very strong interest on the game development industry and trying to solve different type of uh, UX problems for customers like you and uh, also for users who are using our engine. Is this working? No, I don't get a good video. I can only have a few videos, so I need to fix it. And um, so should I continue or should I stop? You can continue if you want. OK. Recording on audio. OK. Um, so, so as you know, the game industry, sometimes people are really interested in tech itself. They may not have, um, and they are fascinated about, like, fascinated about the tech itself. So sometimes they may not have the good understanding of the users. So my job is mostly kind of trying to kind of bridge the gap between users and the tech. So that's what I'm going to, what I'm doing recently. And in the meantime, uh, other than design, I'm also really interested in user research and data. So I believe that sometimes you need to collect enough data, solid data, to help you drive a solid user experience. And also, you can use those data to measure the success of your solution with customers, making sure that you're solving the real problem. Uh, like I mentioned before, um, working in this industry, a lot of people are really fascinated about tech itself, but um, sometimes users may not understand the solution that we provide to them. So my job mostly is to help bridging the gap between the tech and the user, helping the, the team, like people who are fascinated with the tech, to understand who they are designing for and what kind of user they are, they are using their product. And at the same time, uh, for the user to understand the tech so that it can make their life easier. So that's the storytelling of my job. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about what we learn about uh, the current user experience in O3DE. But before I start, can I uh, see a like, show of hands? Like who has been using O3DE so far? Okay. Um, and how many of you have been using O3DE for over a year? Good? <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So. Uh, I wanted to tell a story about um, how we use the different UX methodology to drive the improvement in, in O3DE. 
Um, so this is the onboarding experience that I'm going to talk about. Uh, before we launch O3DE, around 2020, I think, at that time, uh, we were talking about how, what's the best way to help. Hi. Thank you for coming. By the way, feel free to eat. So, by the way, I wanted to see like how many how many of you are using have been using O3DE for those people who just joined us. Okay. Um, uh, so yeah, so so for the onboarding experience. So before we start O3DE, we have been talking about what's the best onboarding experience that we want to define for our new customers. At that time, we have this um, product called Lumberyard as the predecessor of um, O3DE, and we. There is a lot of issues with the onboarding experience in, in Lumberyard at that time. Uh, a lot of people complain about they are not able to set up the product easily. And uh, we log into the data. We also realize that many people kind of um, uh, spend a lot of time trying to, because, because of the disconnected process within the onboarding experience, that a lot of them are not able to understand the different pieces of the information that delivered to them. So they end up spending a lot of time trying to uh, troubleshoot. And when we talk to the customers, we also realize that a lot of them are not, a, like spend more, like on average, they spend probably five, more than five hours trying to set up their engine. And some of them even spend days because they don't know how to troubleshoot. So when we, when we try to introduce O3D to the, to the new customers, uh, there's a discussion, should we continue improving that? But there's also an internal discussion about um, there are customers, most of them are engine developers, and do they, do they want a GUI UI to help them set out the, the engine faster? Is that really important to them? But uh, after we talk to the actual customers, we realize that, yes, they want a very easy to onboard experience, and the reason for that is, is um, they some, some, sometimes they want to see the value of the engine faster. So if they spend days trying to set up something, it, also, it only uh, kind of uh, uh, diminish, diminish the value that they see in this engine. So that's why when we redesign uh, O3D onboarding experience, we decided to focus on a lot of our time and effort trying to improve that onboarding experience. So that's why you see this um, that we call project manager. I, if, I'm not sure if you have been using that, but uh, with the data, uh, we saw by, uh, by looking at the people who are building, using our engine to build uh, the environment, set up the project, it takes them on average less than 20 minutes to set, up, to set it up, so, which is a huge improvement. The reason why I'm telling this story is because I wanted to kind of introduce you what do we mean by user-centered design process. So as I mentioned before, uh, the user-centered design process normally start with a problem. So you, you're trying to understand, you observe a problem from the user, and you're trying to observe why their problems come from, and uh, you further define, you talk to them, and you try to identify different patterns, and then you further define what are the possible solutions to solve that problem. And, and then you start doing design, like proposing different solutions, you validate with customers, you iterate, and then, so this is where you define the problem space. And once you have a solid direction to go, we normally work, start working with the, the dev team and also product team to define, okay, this is the possible solution and how do we want to deliver to the customers? So we start the development process and eventually we release to the, to the, to the customers and we start measuring to make sure that what I mentioned earlier, for example, the different data points that we collect, whether the, the release product really solved those problems. So the data can help us make sure that we are, we are success uh, for the solution. If there's data that's showing up, no, we are not solving the problem correctly, this whole cycle going back to the, to, the, to the emphasize phase that we start observation again and doing the improvement process. So that's the, we call user-centered design process that we have been running in O3DE for a long time. Um, so for all the customers that we have talked to, um, we, we, we talked to more than 100 different type of customers. And this is what we define uh, the different, cat or the ca we try to categorize the different user profiles. So you can say, oh, I am, I am a 
uh, like engine developers or software developers, we, we basically categorize them as the programmers. And the designers are like, for example, uh, tech, uh, design, uh, tech artists, design technologists, or sometimes game designers. They are categorized as a designer and then artist. So those are the way that we kind of uh, group the different users together. And by show of hand, I, can I know like different roles you have? So how many programmers do we have in this room? Okay. Uh, how many designers? Do we have any designers? <laughs> okay. Uh, do we have artists? Yay, okay, okay. So I want to emphasize that artist is the most important role in this, in, in OCD uh, that when we are designing for, because we, when we talk to the different users, even though programmers, they are the one who basically help the team set up or pick their engine first, and they help the team build the environment, set up the engine for the team to start using it. But it was, it was designers and artists who spend most of their time, almost all day, in the engine trying to build content. So oftentimes that when we talk about game engine, it becomes very technical term and, and the, the features that we're designing are not very friendly for, for designers and artists. So that's why I want to emphasize that uh, the, the tools and workflows that we're designing for, we hope that all the designers, even though that they have less technical knowledge, they should be able to use it without problem. Um, but there's also a different uh, things to think about is the different user, the different, the different size of the team also, also would change how we define the different role. Because uh, for a large uh, AAA, game, AAA game studio, normally they would, um, uh, people, they would have more special, specialists who spend most of their time, for example, creating a material. And, but for a smaller game studio, they are more generalist. They, they would wear multiple hats. They would do programming, they would do designing, they would were, they were build the 3D models. So they would do a lot of different things altogether. So with the data that I just shared, uh, we define, further define this design philosophy, trying to uh, drive the user experience in O3DE with the team, and also trying to help us kind of understand building the same alignment across the team. So emphasize on efficiency, uh, we, based on our understandings that cre creative professionals value productivity. We, uh, so we want to optimize the workflow and reduce frictions so the creators can fully immerse in their creative flow. The empowered creativity, on the other hand, is uh, creative freedom is important to the creators to unleash their creativity. So we want to prepare the environment that building the building blocks, prepare, prepare the, the environment with building blocks that enable users to freely explore, prototype, and test their ideas without imposing unnecessary limitations. And the foster learning, on the other hand, uh, we wanted to provide an error tolerant and trustworthy environment to encourage users to master the tools with confidence. Finally, I think the, the encourage contribution and maintain consistency that's uh, unique to O3DE because we are open source and we are modularized. So we want to encourage everybody to be able to contribute in this engine to build the tools and workflows. Um, but at the same time, we also want to provide a safety net for them to, um, to freely kind of build their tools and workflow but still maintain the consistency so the user will be easier for them to, to get on board and start using the different tools that we built for them. Um, so with all those information that I just presented, we further, uh, we, we start to conduct a lot of uh, different type of research. One is the quantitative research, such as um, like survey data, and we also sometimes uh, do the time on task study, like to study how, how much time user would spend building certain, uh, for example, building a 3D model or building a character. Um, the other side is the qualitative study. So once we have the quantitative data, it's important for us to know what's, what drives people to give us certain rating, for example, in survey. And uh, we need to understand the context behind it. So that's where we start the qualitative study to do usability study, customer interview, write along research. 
with both of this data, it helps us better understand where do we want to go and uh, how do we want to improve the product. So here I want to share with you an interesting data point. Um, so we conducted the O3D survey in June to July timeframe. We sent out the survey to, to the whole O3D community. And, um, and this is the result that, turned, that, that, that we, we gathered from those data points. And um, I wanted to explain why we are breaking the product for this nine different bars. So we have over 40 to 50 different feature and workflows in O3DE. And uh, it's hard to ask everybody to, to rate every features that they are using. So instead, we group them into nine workflows. And we ask the user, if you are using certain workflow, please give your ratings. How do you feel about those, uh, uh, the, the result? So this is, uh, the, the, this is the result that user feel about O3DE. So as you can see, uh, they are features that people are quite satisfied. Uh, so I would say the top, the best performing workflow would be onboarding. So like I said, we, we did a lot of uh, improvement on onboarding, so the, the data turns out to be good. And the other one is the experience design, which is including like game design, all the game design logic, like physics, um, uh, UI system that are all underneath the experience the experience building uh, category. And the third one is the log development. So log development includes how people set up their 3D models, uh, materials, textures. And uh, I would say the three underperforming workflow would be uh, world buildings and multiplayer and um, the packaging and deployment. So as you can see, there are still areas that that we can grow and improve together. So, and I want to discuss more later with you on how we can improve those areas. So with the survey data, like I mentioned before, that's the, qual that's the quantitative data. And then we did a lot of, uh, we did further uh, another qualitative research to understand why people are giving us low score. So uh, we conduct a research called Walk the Engine Sessions. Uh, basically, we sit down with the user, we watch them how they perform certain tasks. And uh, for this round, uh, because due to the time constraints, so we, we only pick five workflows, which is onboarding, actor development, log development, multiplayer, and engine extension. So with those research, uh, we collect, we, we interview more than 25 users, and we identify 160, more than 160 issues and then we work with each SIG, uh, each uh, special interest group, trying to understand those issues and uh, basically work with them to come up with a solution. So at the end, the team was really very, very collaborative and we fixed over 60 different issues, including most critical and blocker ones. So with that data, we haven't yet got the second chance to, inter to kind of gather the, the survey data, but we do plan to do that by the end of the year. So we hopefully that we will see a, 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 a big improvement on, in terms of the, the score from the survey. So I want to highlight a few things that we have done good. So that's the outcome of that. Uh, the first one is the reducing the onboarding experience time. So like I said before, that we significantly improved the, the onboarding time. Uh, but in addition to that, the team also worked on the remote project onboarding. So that means that not only you as a uh, like uh, engine developer who are helping your team set up the, the environment, now you can also help your team to get on board easily. So, so that's the remote project uh, onboarding experience. And um, the other one is the, we also shorten the content iteration time. So as I know, as, as I mentioned before, user really cares about, especially the content creators, they really care about their, uh, their creativity and how they can create those, uh, those content faster and iterate faster. So how can we improve that experience that uh, we try, there's a few things that we have tried. The first thing is uh, 3D asset assembly workflow. So we work with the team to really reduce, uh, streamline the experience for people to assemble their 3D assets together 
including assigning materials and textures. So with those uh, improvements that we see, we see people, uh, we, could, we wanted to achieve the goal with what you see is what you get. So basically what you see in your, um, for example, Maya and Blender, once you import those assets into O3DE, they should see the same thing uh, from, from they have created from their DCC tool. So that can reduce the time significantly. The other one is the prefab system. So that also help the team, uh, the, the game or the, the, the content creators to be able to assemble their project or assemble their assets together and be able to do large scale changes easily. So with the combination of those, uh, we have done some rough estimation on time on task. So we roughly estimate that originally it could take hours for people to build a 3D assets together. And now it could, um, it, it, we significantly reduce that time. So using the same assets, we see a reduce of 40, up to 40 minutes uh, per digital assets which means that uh, poten we can potentially save content creators thousands of hours if they are building a large game uh, project. The other one that we have done, uh, been working with the, the, our, our tech artist is trying to improve the artist experience. Like I said, I think artist is super important for us and uh, the, the team has been building some studio toolkits for people to easily bring their assets from their DCC tool to O3DE. Like I mentioned, we want to support the, what you see is what you get. So with those studio toolkits, we uh, help remind user or, or prompt user that there are certain settings that you have to set it up before you bring those assets. So those are the, the improvement that we, we also brought in to O3DE. The, uh, the other one is the networking setup process. So do, I'm not sure if you remember the, the multiplayer, the multiplayer workflow, uh, the CSAT rating, the set, customer satisfaction rating was very low. It was 2.3, around 2.3. So we worked closely with the team, um, with, the, with the networking SIG, trying to improve that workflow. And uh, we, the team has done a lot of a lot of improvement, including like set up a simple networking component so people can easily extend their engine with their with their own needs. And uh, we also automate the process between like server and client integration. So so make sure that the connection is automated so it's easier for users to test their concept. So with all those improvement, um, we before we we run the, the same study with the users we saw a uh, user would take up to more than two hours trying to build the, the whole experience and they still failed. But with the new experience, we test again with the users, we see that users are able to finish the workflow without much of our prompt, without even reading through the documentation. They will be able to finish that within 30 minutes. So which is a huge improvement. So um, for, the net, for the multiplayer. So hopefully that we will see the score growing up from 2.3 to something, uh, 3.5 or something, I hope. Um, and they are, um, so there's another one is uh, our, we try, also try to standardize, let me see if I can play it. Is it playing? Okay. Um, so it, so we, we, are also, we also did a lot of work on the viewport experience improvement to help people uh, manipulate their, their assets in the viewport to help them build faster, iterate faster. And this example that I'm showing to you is called uh, component editing mode. So people can now easily get all the related tools and workflows uh, closer to the object that they are working on. So, so it's easier for them to manipulate and iterate. So that's one of the experience that we also did, but this is just one of them. So we have done a lot of different improvement related to viewport. Finally, uh, as I mentioned, the, the modularized and, um, uh, how do you call that? The modularized and, cons and maintain the consistency. That's why we introduced the BlueJ design system to help user uh, build faster and still maintain the, the, the user experience, the consistent user experience. And I know Lee, Yes. Yeah. 
Thank you. OK, so uh, then it's the opportunity. So I talk about the good things. And now it's the opportunity that how we want to, how we can improve the user experience together. So I list down a few areas that people constantly mention. I, I heard team also mentioned about it. Uh, related to, for example, how can we help the team build a first playable game effectively? Um, so I think this is still a challenge for us. And uh, so, so there are different tool sets or workflows that we can help improve. So what are they? And the second one is the troubleshooting process. So our error messages right now are still need some work that we are sometimes giving user like error messages may not be self-explanatory enough for for them to do the troubleshooting themselves. So we see that people often spend a lot of time trying to search on Google or documentation, trying to, trying to uh, kind of go, get over those uh, error, error codes that they have received. But they, uh, and they spend a lot of time on that. So how can we reduce that process, the, the time they spend on this? The team collaboration is another one. So especially with uh, pandemic, a lot of team working remotely, how do they collaborate um, and feel safe that their, their data and changes can still be kept uh, while they're working on different areas in the game? So that's a, a huge area that people has been concerned about and um, that's worth talking about. And the help system is another area that uh, we have been trying to improve. and. We have been, honestly, we have been receiving a lot of different feedback regarding our help system. It's not very helpful. And, but of course, I think part of the reason is that some areas of the engine may, needs to be improved further so that user may not need to rely on documentation. However, when we can reach to that state, they, that documentation itself is still needed. So how can we kind of effectively building the help system to help people learn faster, be able to master the, the, the engine, different workflows faster, I think that's a, a topic to, to, to think about. Finally, is the packaging and deployment. So um, how can we help user, once they build a project, they want to test on different platform, how can we help user transition those to those different platform easier and be able to uh, share those builds with their game, with their, with their uh, friends or even investors uh, to taste those uh, concepts faster. I think that's another area. So. Um, that's, that's my, the data that I shared. Um, now I want to hear from you. So uh, I prepared this exercise called What My We. Basically is uh, a way that we can work together to share your ideas with us. Um, I don't know, we can, we can do this kind of free of hands, like raising your hand to talk about, hey, what are the areas you want to improve? or you want to share with, with us uh, the feedback or pain points that you have been using, in o, like you, you've been facing in O3DE, or we can write it down, whichever way you feel more comfortable. Should we write it down? Yeah. yeah. So uh, we have the post-it uh, on your table, and we have pens. And I don't know, um, so I know, there, are there people online? Do you know? Okay, um, yeah, so I would encourage people online, if you have feedback to the engine, to the workflow that you are using, feel free to uh, type them and send it over in chat so we can, we can discuss them. Okay, thank you. Testing? Oh, there we go. We have a mic. Uh, it's okay, I have this, yeah. Thank you. So uh, just some tips, like how my we guideline is uh, basically uh, start with the problem that you, you, you uncovered and be broad. So 
and don't and suggest don't mention the solution because uh, we want to keep the idea broad and uh, some room for discussion. And um, it can be, so it, do, it doesn't need to be all surrounded with the opportunity that I listed here. It can be about metaverse. I know there's a lot of conversation about metaverse and I'm wondering what do people think O3D needs to do related to metaverse, so yeah. Should we do like five minutes? Do you want to give some examples? Yeah, I was gonna ask if we can go back to the uh, Yeah, sure, sure, sure. The next, the this one? one? Yeah. The whole. Oh, put things up where they uh, can see them. Oh, yeah. Or do you want to stay focused on you? Um, yeah, yeah, we can focus on that one too. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, for the people thinking out there, out loud, um, yeah, it's normally easy to just type right in how might we, and then you sort of end it up with the, with the problem. We have some examples up there. To save time, you can just type in, uh, right, sorry, HMW, and then, yeah, just write your solution out there. Thank you. And if you finish um, writing, maybe we can put it over here. So, um, and for Yes. Wow, some people wrote a lot. Yeah. I just did the H and Oh, well, I like your handwriting. <laughs> All caps, nice and easy to read. Yeah. <laughs> this one's even bigger. <laughs> nice, thank you. Yeah, of course. 
Have you all turned your ideas? Okay. My 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 session is until my session is until one twenty, right? Okay. Is there anyone wants to talk about their ideas? Yes, please. Uh, this morning session, uh, one of the speakers was actually talking about how AI can be used to help auto-generate content. Uh, they were using actually the generation of uh, yeah. photographs. And, and so I'm wondering, how is it that we can actually help users generate uh, things that are needed for world building AI. Mm. So you mean like they can define what type of games they are building and, um, and we can automatically generate different assets for the type of game, they're, the, 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 the world that they are defining for their games? Yes, at a high level that would be exactly it. Uh, the ideal situation would be as a designer or artist could describe that world and then some open source tool will auto-generate that world using an AI model. That would be cool. I love this idea. Anything else? Well, I don't have the solution, it, but it is a question. It's like, can oh. we do that? Is that something that we can actually use within O3DE? It would be a nice tool and feature for the system, even if it was a very basic uh, Feature. You know, for example, you showed a slide where uh, we were expanding and contracting a box, which was one single object within the uh, creator's uh, suite. It would be nice to just be able to describe that box, and then the AI system behind the scenes would generate what that box is within the uh, designer space, just using toy, uh, voice or textual uh, a description of what that object is. Same thing would apply to spears or buildings, weapons, whatever objects may actually uh, need to be put into the game. Uh, it would be nice to have an AI generated uh, object as opposed to having to create each one of those objects by hand. I, I know, Chris, you want to say something? Um, so, uh, yeah, it's Jason and no worries. Yeah, so as JC and I were actually just kind of sidebarring about, there's a lot of different engines right now that are doing AI-generated artwork and, and assets and those things. And they're great starting points, right, for inspiration or um, to get you to start thinking about how you want to design. Um, and so there's a place for that, whether it needs to be actually part of O3D or just services that we tap into, right, is kind of the question and, and the point. Um, but to be clear, you know, they, uh, they should be viewed as starting points that we then iterate on and, and innovate with. It would be really good to have, you know, systems that, or frameworks that would allow you to describe an environment that you may not understand how to hook together and what would be required for it, so it gives you a starting point. But um, the auto-generation of, I want this level to do this with these mechanics and it with these types of objects, and then it just auto-populates and off you go. Um, that's an ambitious goal, to be sure, but I think you're right that that is part of the future of design, right, is being able to leverage these tools. Right now, I think we're at a point of more inspiration versus actual practical application uh, of them. But interfacing with other third-party services to do that would be a very, uh, I think, uh, interesting goal for the O3D community to pursue.
No. Nothing to say for yourself? No. Nope. Okay. Yes. Hi, I got some comments on this area, I think. So one of the things I, I know that what you want is something that I think all the designers dreams want to have for years. But as far as I know, I think that tech is just not ready yet. If you search online or just looking for academic research, they have preliminary tools to do things like that. But the result is far from ideal to be actually being practical in use. But I think what you said might be kind of a, something that we can start with is like, what if I want is not just populating a world from just what I described. It's more specific to the engine mechanism itself. Like, okay, I want to enable certain features of the engine, but I don't know how to do that. Can I just describe my intention and the engine do it for us? Because this is a much, much more narrow contact, context, which you can train your AI model to do pretty well, instead of being a general kind of AI to describe whatever I say. That's what I'm thinking. We maybe we can where we can, where we can start with that. Yeah. That, that would be amazing for especially for artists. They don't they no longer need to learn how to use the tool. They just need to describe, right? Yeah, that's a great idea. Uh, info, crazy idea. Uh, please say your name and where you come from, just so if people are following up, they want to talk to these fantastic people talking. Uh, the, you know, we can get that in the recording as well. Thank you. Any other questions or suggestions, thoughts? They're all very interesting uh, possible opportunity for us to think about in the future. So uh, I know our time is up. And um, sorry, you want us to ask questions? When you said question, not just about that, but other questions. That yeah. Are better here. Yeah. If we have, can I just ask one? Sure. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Chris Melisinos from AWS. And uh, the one that I put up there was, as we're thinking about a world of content creators that are moving into the industry, specifically in the games industry, that don't really have necessarily programming backgrounds. They're designers, right? The design backgrounds. Start thinking about the ways we're able to capture user playthrough data in a way that makes sense to a designer versus a programmer. And I go back and think of things like Super Mario Maker, which is awesome if anyone's ever used it before and you create a level and you throw it out there and it shows you along the entire trajectory of everybody playing it where everybody is dying in the level, where problems were in the level and people can comment. So somebody who has zero programming background, zero engine experience can actually build and continue to iterate on a proper level, on a better level at that highest level of interaction. So to your point of enabling the engine to be useful for non-programmers. Mm. That is the world we're moving into, whether it's game development or general application development. From moving forward, that is going to be the level at which we play, that low code, kind of no code space. So anything we can do to help designers to better understand problems in mechanics in games, I think would be an amazing ambition for the community. Thanks. I love the idea. Yeah, I'm uh, actually, my name's Lee, Lee Hong Yun. Uh, I'm a UX designer at AWS. Uh, another example of that is uh, back in the day, Warcraft had their, you know, map creator or Starcraft had their map creator where they enabled regular people that played the game just to make their custom maps. And now it has happened to spawn a billion dollar industry of tower defense mobile games and Dota and League of Legends. That's also another big thing where they just enabled regular users to make whatever now, look what it's come today, right? Okay. So thank you so much for sharing with, uh, with us your ideas. And what I'm going to do is uh, to type all of this into um, our roadmap. So we do have O3D UX roadmap. If you're interested, you can scan this. This is on GitHub. And uh, all of your ideas will be there. And so that uh, one of us or future somebody would like to pick up the idea and start working on them. Um, that's the beauty of uh, open source. Um, so the other thing I'd also like to encourage you to think about is uh, we are going to run another session of user walk the engine sessions to see, to watch people, how do they use the engine, what kind of problem they encounter. So if you are interested, please sign up here. So this is a simple Google form. So we like to watch you, how you struggle with using O3DE or how do you love O3DE. So we can document all of your ideas. Even though that you have never used O3DE, I think I would also strongly encourage you to do so. Okay, thank you so much for your time.